So let's look at the first game, social dilemma game in the lab. It will be the trust game that we already talked about, but in a slightly different situation than this guy falling backward <laughs> without knowing whether he'll be caught or not. Using the terminology of the action situation, the simplest baseline trust game is composed of the following elements. So remember, we have to always know these to understand the game and the uh, outcome and measure human behavior in this uh, action arena. Participants, usually two persons play the game. Positions, the two positions are player one who is considered, let's say, an investor and player two is a trustee. So. You, the trustee, uh, yeah, we'll see how this works in a minute. Actions. Player 1 is given 10 tokens at the beginning of the game. Player 1 then has the choice of how many of those 10 tokens to keep and how many to send to player 2. Choosing to send tokens to player 2 has the impact of increasing the value of the tokens. So this is the action situation where there is some sharing involved. Act player 1, the investor, gives some money to the trustee, but the total value of the tokens goes up. So this is the basic motivation. Otherwise, the game is a non-starter, right? In typical trust experiments, the number of tokens sent by player 1 is doubled or tripled. So we'll see this in a minute. After the experimenter has increased the amount that player 1 has sent, this amount is sent on to player 2. So player 1 decides he will send some, he or she will send some amount of the uh, share. Somebody in the middle amplifies it by twice or three times and then passes it to player 2, the trustee. Once player 2 has received this amount, player 2 has to make a decision. This is where the dilemma comes in because once player one knows what the trustee will do or has repeated uh, experience then the dilemma also comes to player one in terms of how to share but the main idea is to see whether player one starts by being selfish egoist rational selfish player or is there something more to it in terms of human behavior that we expect Okay, so look at the figure, it becomes clearer. Trust game with payoffs used by Berg et al., the paper we mentioned. Uh, investor has 10 tokens given to him or her. So X is given uh, to the, let's say, middleman, and the trustee gets it amplified. So let's say he gets 3X tokens. I will say he just for convenience but we can just shift to she I guess so investor gets 10 tokens she gives X to somebody that somebody makes it triple the amount gives it to trustee then the trustee has to decide to give back something to the investor this is part of the rule otherwise you know that over repeated interactions this will collapse so trustee then decides to give the investor an amount Y in tokens so the trustee had uh, 3x, then she will end up with 3x minus y. Investor had 10 to start with, gave away x, one will get back y. So, investor in the end will have 10 minus x plus y. So, if x is related to y, then obviously the investor will begin to figure out how to share this or how to give away X and here the idea is that the investor doesn't know the trustee doesn't know the amount coming back maybe there are situations where this is much more known let's say you are somebody who's putting money in the bank the bank tells you how much interest he will get and bank does something with your money invests it and makes more money out of it and gives some of it back to you that's the game right they have to make money out of your money but some banks will tell you that the checking account will get no interest because you are always able to withdraw it whereas savings has some interest or you can make a fixed deposit which stays there locked up for a certain time and the amount of interest you earn will depend on how long you are willing to lock it up and so on so you can begin to imagine the real world where you are playing these trust games you know it's a bank you trust the bank but it's not some person right so this is how it works player 2 has to decide on the number of tokens to return to player 1 the outcomes outcomes are the size of the funds allocated to the two persons in light of the decisions they have made action outcome linkages 
The amount invested by player 1 in player 2 earns a rate of return supplied by the experimenter. So the experimenter is amplifying in the middle uh, of 1 plus R. So if R is 2, then the uh, player 1 gives uh, 10 tokens to player 2. Player 2 gives, uh, player 2 receives 30 tokens because R is 2. So 10 plus 2 times 10 is 30. You get 30 tokens. It's not the interest rate. It's the multiplier. If player 1 gives 2 tokens, player 2 receives, uh, you know, uh, 2 plus 4, so 6, right? So 6 tokens. Information, both players are informed of the complete range of possibilities and that their own identity will remain anonymous to the other player and to the experiment if there is a double blind kind of experiment that is performed which adds different kinds of uh, value that we won't get into. Potential payoffs. The payoffs are affected by the rate of return, which is 1 plus R. So the trustee is getting a return of 1 plus R. In most trust experiments, R is assumed to be 2, but this is not a very strict rule. This means that the amount that player 1 sends to player 2 is multiplied by the experimenter. The playoff to uh, payoff to player 1 is 10 minus x plus y because gives away x and receives y back. Whereas where y is the number of tokens that player 2 returns to player 1 obviously. The payoff for player 2 is 1 plus r times x which is what the multiplier does and then y is subtracted because that's given back to player 1. So x is, uh, if x is 0 then player 2's playoff, uh, payoff is 0, so then there will be no y. x is 0, then he gets nothing, so player 1 keeps everything, but uh, depending on what y is, he may actually lose, right? So if you don't put the money in the bank, you don't get interest, so you actually lose something, right? Simple. If you keep your money in the pillow, you may feel safer, but you don't. your money doesn't earn money. Although this experimental design of the trust game is simple, it captures the essence of trusting and reciprocal behavior so effectively that it's been replicated and extended in many different settings and countries. Some of you may be surprised at the high that surprised that at the high levels of let me read it again. Some of you may be surprised at the high levels of trust exhibited in this experiment without knowing how much you know, if the bank tells you the interest rate, it's one thing, but if you're doing this blindly where you don't know how much will come back and you still are able to send an X that is higher than, let's say, rational behavior, rational behavior maybe would be zero, but if Y is positive, then does that make X as large as possible? No, only if you know Y is greater than X, you may send X. So you have to think about how rationality is working in this case, right? So just the level of trust is higher than one would expect. The common theory used to make predictions in this action situation assumes selfish rational behavior and predicts no investment. So they, it will say uh, investor one, investor will not send any money, to, any money to the trustee. Investor is not expected to trust an unknown stranger enough to send any funds. The empirical data challenges this conventional theory that people actually do send. It's kind of a, you know, uh, reciprocal uh, behavior where you invest assuming something will come back but if you keep sending and nothing comes back obviously you will stop so the rationality in this case uh, in the first instant is a bit irrational that you are sending money without knowing what will happen but you build trust and your rationality comes back in your action after you know the outcome but Upfront, a priori people can be irrational in the sense that they have high trust and they send money to unknown people. How people make decisions. We have mentioned that theory predicts that predict participants will act as selfish, rational human beings when faced with a decision that involves costs and benefits to themselves. This is the terminology I, have, I should have used before. Yet, we have just discussed a set of experiments that show that people do not make decisions in that way. So why do, pe why do we make these assumptions? These assumptions relate to rational choice theory, an important theory in social sciences. Rational choice theory is a framework for understanding economic and social behavior, 
we define it more precisely uh, below. It has proven to be valuable in predicting human behavior in stable competitive market settings. Okay, In stable and repetitive, s repetitive settings, individuals are able to learn about the full relevant structure of the situation and attach preferences to actions and outcomes. This is how stock markets what work. This is how banks work. You know, if people suddenly stopped trusting the banks and started withdrawing money because there was a rumor or something happened, then the bank obviously has taken the money from people, has invested it somewhere, doesn't sit on all the cash that people give because then it cannot make money, right? It cannot multiply investors' money unless it invests it elsewhere for more interest or uh, returns, right? And then it can give some of those returns back to the investors. So if everybody wants their deposits back then the bank can go bankrupt because they don't have that kind of cash okay so outcomes depend on that sense predict in that sense on both behaviors but repeated uh, experiences with any particular bank or stock etc will give you ways to make choices more rationally predictions from these models are empirically supported at an aggregate level in an open competitive market settings not an in open competitive market settings and an individual level at an individual level in carefully designed experimental settings of competitive market situations where Vernon Smith did some of the pioneering work. What are the assumptions of the rational choice theory? Let's read this carefully. Individuals possess as much information about the structure of a situation as is contained in the situation itself. You have bank, you have you, you have your money and you have all the information you need to make this uh, transaction. That is, they have perfect information about the world around them and the situation they are in. Individuals assign a complete and consistent internal valuation to outcomes that is a monotonic function of an individual's own net external payoff. So you know what payoff is going to be so you are making an internal evaluation on you know which stock to invest in, how to split your portfolios and so on. Or when you give money to someone you know from repeated experience or from all the information you have of the action arena that action situation that this money is likely to come back so you make that judgment as well. Put simply, this means that individuals will always prefer more units of product to less units. Okay. Furthermore, if an individual likes product A more than product B and product B more than product C, then this individual will also like product A more than product C. Induction, very simple. After making a complete analysis of the situation, individuals choose an action in light of their resources to maximize expected material net benefits to themselves given what they expect others to do. So there is a expectation of others based on your action situation experience and the information you have gathered. So let's read this again. After making a complete analysis of the situation, individuals choose an action in light of their resources to maximize expected material net benefits to themselves given what they expect others to do. It sounds complicated. Basically that means if you have X income of X and you have disposable income of Y, then how you invest that Y in a stock market and which kind of stock you choose, of course depends on your own risk taking behavior etc. But also on you know the complete analysis of situation will tell you Apple will keep going up for a while or Google or whatever and so on. So there are obviously internal valuations involved as we said but given the information and the analysis of the situation you will make choices in light of your resources how much you invest will depend on how much income you have in case there is an emergency so you don't lock up your in investments in non-liquid assets or uh, investments that are not available so you have to have all those things figured out in terms of your resources and the fraction you are going to put into uh, the market or whatever but this we say expect what others to do others here are banks or stock market or uh, 
any other loan you make to somebody or investment you make in building an uh, uh, you know something and renting it out and so on and so forth many many situations you can imagine okay so let's leave this here and then uh, look at this further because this is kind of a continuous uh, storyline and we have to read all these because uh, it's all descriptive and discursive so just remember what rational choice theory says and then we'll come back and continue with our uh, action arena action situation and dilemmas and how people behave okay